All right. So uh, as we're here, we're beginning our uh, message. We're beginning uh, our part two of Limitless Vision Forward. Okay. We're in this series talking about vision, talking about the vision that God has for our lives and why it is important to be people of vision. Now, if you were not here last week, we'll talk later, but if you were not here last week, please go to YouTube or uh, wherever you listen to podcasts or to Facebook and uh, uh, listen to last week's message because this is going to bring you up to where we are today. We, we, we talked about the four uh, reasons that we, that, that why we should be people of vision, okay? We discussed that. We defined vision as divine revelation or insight provided by God to individuals or groups regarding his will, his purpose, or his plan for their lives or their situations. We defined vision as divine revelation or insight provided by God to individuals or groups regarding his will, purpose, and plans for their lives. A scripture for this series is Habakkuk 2, chapter 2. It'll be up on the screen. For those of you watching online, welcome. You'll see it on the lower third uh, below. And the Lord answered me, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. So we defined what vision was. And here the Lord is speaking to vision. Today we want to answer the question, why should vision matter to me? Why should vision matter to me? Should I see vision as important in my life? We read last week Proverbs 29 verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. But happy is the one who keeps the law. Last week, we defined what vision was, as I just said, and then we defined what unrestrained meant. And so when we take these two definitions and we insert them into the scripture, it says, where there is no divine revelation or insight provided by God, there is no discipline, no order, and there exists a lack of moral boundaries and guidance. So as we move into today, what I want you to do is I want you to resist the temptation to think that this does not apply to you. I want you to resist the temptation to think that this does not apply to you. Because there's something inside that would say, Pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't understand what's happening in my life. I have bigger fish to fry than vision. You don't understand the circumstances that are surrounding me, the, the issues, all of the things. I don't have time to think or pursue vision because I need to handle this other stuff. And I would give pause. And I would consider you to think about it the opposite way. You don't have time to worry about the issues and the things that are going to continue to happen in your life. You need to be pursuing God's vision for your life. You need to be pursuing God's vision for your life. Doesn't matter who you are, male or female, whether you're young or seasoned. I got you. I got you. It doesn't matter your age. 
It doesn't matter your gender. You need to pursue God's vision for your life. As a believer, vision must matter to you, and you must see it as primary and important in your life. Why? Because last week we said vision gives purpose. We said that vision is the guide marker on the road to destiny. I'm just trying to find out this plan for my, I just want to know what my life is about. Vision is the guide marker on the road to destiny, but most importantly, to pick up where we left off last week, we must pursue God-given vision because God's given vision is so much bigger than just you and I. It's so much bigger than just us. Why was Moses sent to Pharaoh? Why was Noah charged to build a boat? Why was David sent to Goliath? Vision. But not just any vision, a vision that was way bigger than just them. I, I, I like this word. It's called visioneers. And it's people who walk out vision. And as visioneers, we must be fully aware that when God gives us vision, it's way bigger than our success. It's way bigger than our agenda. It's way bigger than our benefit. And it is more precious than we could ever imagine. Sometimes we'll ask God for his vision or his plan for our life selfishly. God, I know that there is something that you called me to do, God. What is it that you want me to do? Here I am, your servant, Lord. What is it that you want me to do for you? So you can say that you did it. But it's so much bigger than the role that you are playing. Moses was sent to Pharaoh, not for Moses, but for the entire nation of Israel. Noah was given the vision to build a boat, not to increase Noah's carpentry resume, but for the actual continuization of, excuse me, the continuation of civilization. Everything. Jesus came to this earth, not so that he could experience humanity, but so that humanity could encounter Jesus. It was bigger than the person, and the vision that God has for you and I is way bigger than just you and I. Isaiah says, my, my, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways uh, your ways, declares the Lord. He says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The vision is way bigger than you and I. When I was young, er, (laughs) when I was younger, uh, my mother used to make a big deal out of me cleaning the toilet. I now have two boys. My wife. And I make it a big deal that they clean the toilet, that they clean the restroom when they leave it. The reason that we make it a big deal is not necessarily for them. The reason that we make it a big deal that they clean the toilet is for who's going to come in that restroom after them. Oh, y'all, 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 y'all ain't never been in no nasty bathroom before. <laughs> y'all ain't experienced some parents who haven't made it a big deal that they. <laughs> the reason that we tell them to, to, to wipe it down, the reason that we tell them to pick up everything off the floor and, and to, to make sure everything is dry and, and to make sure that they're aiming in the right direction, amen. Uh, the reason that we do that is for whether it's myself, my wife, or whoever is going to enter the restroom after them, but it's not just them. 
Because when they get older, they're going to be in college and they're going to have roommates. And, and it's for the roommates that they will encounter when they get older. It's not just for the roommates. It's, it's actually for the wife that they will have when they get older. So when they get in the restroom, God, God, they, they will say, oh, uh, somebody taught you something. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's not just for them in that moment. It goes way beyond just them in that moment. It is something that will affect other people for the rest of their life. It's way bigger than just you and I. It's way bigger. And and here's the thing. My boys don't necessarily like cleaning the bathroom. They find it an inconvenience to clean the bathroom. They don't enjoy it. They don't see the reason why they're being told to clean the bathroom in the moment. They don't see the benefit. They might look at it as cruel and unusual, that we make it a big deal that they clean the toilet in the moment they may not like it. Why? Because they don't see what we see. They don't see what we see. But it's bigger than just them. In Genesis, we, we meet Joseph. And this is where I'm going to park at today. In Genesis, we meet Joseph, and Joseph is a man of a vision God has given him, vision for his life. And we see how Joseph's vision and the vision that was given to him is way bigger than just him. And from this story, as we walk through this story, I just want to pull four reminders while you're walking in vision. Four reminders. The first three will come quick. The last one we're going to spend some time on. Four reminders. Genesis chapter 37, let's start in verse 5. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and his word. Verse 9, then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, the father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mothers and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Joseph tells this vision that God has given him. Those who are around him don't believe it. And soon as this happens, he begins to encounter uh, some uh, less than ideal circumstances. Okay? If you haven't read this, I would encourage you to read 37, chapters 37 through 42. It is an incredible story. But just to give you some cliff notes, he tells them this, 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 this vision. He then gets thrown into a pit by his brothers. After that, he gets sold into slavery by his brothers. Then as he's in slavery, he he gets lied on by his master's wife, and then he is thrown into the palace prison. Already we got a couple of lessons that we should see on our way to vision. Uh, Number one, be careful who you share your vision with. Be careful who you share the vision that God has given you with. 
We say this all the time. When God called you to purpose, it was not a conference call. He talked to you. He didn't ask for an audience. It was direct to your heart. Be careful who you share your vision with. Everyone can't see what God has for you. It don't matter who it is. It doesn't matter who it is. Everyone can't see what God has for you. Stop asking the blind to proofread your vision. Okay? Be careful who you share your vision with. Yes. Number two, trust God more intently, especially when the vision seems impossible. Trust God more intently, especially when it seems impossible. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, and I keep saying this, but I keep bringing it back, and I'm going to keep saying it until we get it. The enemy's main job is to get you in unbelief. That's it. Plain and simple. His main job is to get you in unbelief. So if that's his job and that's the thing that he's trying to do, then it would make sense that as he's trying to do that, all of the circumstance around you wouldn't actually be leading you to vision. If that's what he's trying to do, he wouldn't be like, yeah, you got a call for your life? Yes, let's just, yeah, come on. Let's open every door. Let's make it as easy as possible for you to fulfill what God has for you. Yeah, that's not what Satan does. It's actually the exact opposite. How can I get you in unbelief? How many things can I throw at you? How many distractions can I throw your way? How many things can I get you in bondage to so that you won't fulfill the vision for your life? How busy can I make you? How, bu- how, and here's another one. How can I get you all of the things that you want so that you won't go and fulfill the vision that God has for you? How much money can I give you? How busy can I make your schedule? How pretty can I make it look? Sometimes the thing that the enemy does is give you exactly what you want. Keeps you comfortable. It keeps you, oh, oh yes, God must be blessing me because I'm getting everything that I want. And you're nowhere near the vision, the plan, and the purpose that he has for you. His main job is to get you in unbelief. So if he gets you to a place, and pastor, how do you know that? Um, Because he's been doing it since the beginning of time. Genesis, he started with this. Nothing has changed. The playbook is very simple. It's it's one play. (laughs) Did the Lord say? That you shouldn't eat of any of the trees in the garden? Same play. Unbelief. So we cannot waver. We must be resolved, resolute. We, we, We must be immovable, especially when it seems impossible. The intensity of the attack is often based on the value of the vision. The greater the intensity, the more precious this thing is. Stop considering how hard it is and consider how valuable it is. Why is the enemy attacking me? Why won't he leave me alone? Why is it so hard for me to come to church? Why is it so hard for me to serve? Why is it that everything around me is falling apart and it's not you? It's bigger than you. It's what's in you. Number three, walking in vision and your calling. It's not dependent on your circumstances, okay? 
Walking in vision in your calling is not dependent on your circumstances. I said it like this. Outward aggravation doesn't change inward destination. We look at what's happening around us to determine if we're doing what God has called us to do. If it's good, then we must be doing what God has called us to do. If it's bad, if we encounter friction, if we encounter opposition, if we encounter any of those things, then I must not be in the will of God. The first thing we ask ourselves is, Lord, what did I do? Right? Because it looks bad on the outside. But here's the thing. It doesn't change God's plan. It doesn't change God's vision for your life. Pastor, you don't understand. I used to run hard for Christ, and somehow I've fallen away, and, and I'm just really trying to get, yep, got it. Ain't changed. The vision is still the vision. The plan is still the plan. Now, whether you want to get in line with that or not is completely up to you. But he says his vision hasn't changed. Your outward circumstance hasn't changed what I put in you. The things that you've decided to do or not decided to do hasn't changed what I put in you. You decide whether you want to walk it out or not. Joseph encountered so many things. And no matter what he encountered, he trusted God. He trusted God in the midst of his situations. And here's the thing. uh, um, The Lord didn't change his situations. He was called, he had vision, he was sold into slavery, he was in a pit, he got lied on, he got put in prison. But here's the faithfulness of God. In the midst of what he was going through, God moved while he was in it. He moved while he was in it. He got sold into slavery, he became the best of all of the slaves that were there. He got put into prison. He became the one who was in charge of everybody else who was in prison. He didn't change the situation, but he prospered him in the midst of it. Some of us don't think that we're following God's plan because we're still in the midst of the situation. And God's saying, I'm not changing the situation. I'm changing you in the midst of the situation. Walking in vision is not dependent on your circumstances. Joseph trusts God and he pursued God for his life. And we pick it up in chapter 42 after everything that Joseph has gone through. And there is a severe famine in all of the land. Except Egypt. There's food in Egypt. There's plenty in Egypt. And guess who is now prime minister of Egypt, second in command to Pharaoh, and in charge of all of the affairs, including the food? Look, looky, looky here. <laughs> Who's in charge of everything? Shows, uh, Genesis 42, verse 1. When Jacob, who was Joseph's father, learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are y'all looking at one another? (laughs) He said, behold, I've heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Wonder where he got that from. (laughs) Thus, the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came for the famine uh, was in the land of Canaan. Now, Joseph. Now, Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all of the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers, oh, well, well, well. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Are we 
to bow down. Are we indeed to bow down to you? Ain't that what they said? Are we, uh, uh, are you to rule over us? Even though Joseph had to walk through circumstances that he never imagined, and he had to face opposition and seemingly unfair situations, God worked through it all. And at the appointed time, at the appointed time, God's vision for Joseph's life came to pass. And the Lord answered to me, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. For the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie if it seems slow. I wish you would have said it will seem slow. But I'm not going to add or take away. He says if it seems slow, wait for it. Even though you might be in a pit, wait for it. Even though you might seem like you're in bondage, wait for it. Even though it might look like you're encountering some unfair circumstances, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. You may walk through some things you never imagined. You you may face some oppositions that you never prepared prepared for. You might face some circumstances. But when you hold fast to the word of God that has been given to you, God's vision for your life will come to pass. God's vision for your life will come to pass. Why? Because the vision is bigger than you. The vision is bigger than you. Joseph sees his family and he has a couple of encounters and with his family, we pick it back up in chapter 45 and verse 4. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near to him and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years and yet there are five years that there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all of his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Joseph said, it was bigger than me. It was bigger than me. So much bigger than me. See, you thought that what you did was going to stop God's plan for my life. But what actually happened is God used what you did to put me right where I needed to be so that he, see, he said, I will work all things together for the good. He didn't say it would be good, but he said, don't worry about it. I'm working as I always have. Yeah. They put you in the pit. I prosper you in the pit. Yeah. Oh, they want to oh, they sell you into slavery. Don't worry. I'm going to take care of you while you're in slavery. Oh, you, 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 you in prison. Don't worry. I'll make sure you're good. It don't matter because why? My vision for your life will still come to pass. I just need you to trust me. I need you to be immovable and I need you to hear what I am saying and not walk in unbelief. It's bigger than you. It is bigger than you. So much bigger than you and I. You're going to have to go through some things. That is not determined whether you're walking in vision. This is what God has called you to. I remember, uh, Ms. Jimey, you can come. I've walked this story out myself. 
having vision. Walking is something that you believe that God told you was it. Walking through circumstances and, and having that gut, that, that feeling in the pit of your stomach because you know, like, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't, I don't know how this is going to come to pass. And I remember having the conversation with people who I thought were like going to be excited. You know, you, you get it and you hear it, you're like, I can't wait to tell somebody. I can't wait to tell those around me. I can't wait to do it. And then when you do, you're met with opposition. Are you sure that's what God called you to do? Here you go. It doesn't look like that's what you should be doing. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. If you, if you say so, and then you have that feeling, is that what God said? Did I hear him? Was it just me? I remember my wife and I walking through unfair circumstances. And we made a decision that says, you know what? We will not try to defend ourselves. We will let God be our vindicator. We have to focus on what he's called us to do. I remember there were even times where my wife said, don't say anything. Because I'm excited. I want to tell everybody. I can't wait to tell everybody. Close your mouth. Don't say anything. And walking through that pain and that, but I want to, uh-uh. I'm -uh. walking through that season, walking through those, and, and just having to say, okay, God, you called me to this, and so I'm, I'm making the decision that whether I got to go by myself was just me and her and nobody else. I got to do what you've called me to do. The vision that God has given you is precious. This is what I need you to see. The vision that God has given you is precious. We don't trust everybody with our kids. It's just me, okay. Uh, uh, we don't trust everybody with our kids. When they were babies, there's some people that say, hey, can I hold your child? No, I don't know you. You're not holding my child. I don't trust you. Can your kid come and spend the night? No, unfortunately not. I don't know you. I don't trust you. This is my seed. These are my, my children. This is precious to me. The vision that God has given you is precious. He's entrusted you with it. He found you trustworthy. He's entrusting you with this vision that he's given you. And he's, he said, here, what are you going to do with what he's entrusted you with? As we walk through that process and we walk through that moment and then we begin to have conversations and then we begin to have uh, uh, more conversations and God begin to open doors and begin to showing me as we begin to walk on the path. Yes, this is what I called you to do. Yes, uh, uh, this is how I want you to move. And then to stand here today, one month away from celebrating three years and walking in the vision that called my wife, that God called my wife and I to. And realizing it's bigger than us. It was way bigger than us. I told my wife last night, I said, when I was uh, uh, doing music full time, I, yes, it was what God called me to do for that time. I said, but it was mostly about me. It was dependent on me whether I recorded it, whether I, I got it done and the videos, all of these different things. God says, no, the vision that I have for you is way bigger than you. That's the same thing he's telling you today. There are people, there are communities, there are neighborhoods, there are families who need to encounter Jesus. And the only way that they will be able to do that is when you say yes to his vision. 
when you stop running from what he called you to, when you make a decision to accept it, no matter who goes with you. Say, this is what God called me to do. This is what I will do. There are people who are waiting for you to walk in vision. There are families, there are communities who are waiting for you to walk in vision. And while vision may seem daunting, let me tell you something. <laughs> Planning a church? Yeah. Visions may seem daunting. How, Lord, will I do this? The road may be fraught with trials. But remember, God is working even in the midst of those trials. He's working behind the scene, orchestrating everything for our good. And just like Joseph, we may face opposition. We may encounter circumstances. We may encounter hurdles that seem insurmountable. But God's vision for our life, we must remember, is always bigger than we can see or that we can comprehend. I don't want you to leave here today inspired. I want you to leave here emboldened. I want you to leave here today ready to embrace the vision that God has for you. I want you to leave here today and maybe you put it down. Maybe you forgot about it. Maybe life, life started life and you said, I'll get back to that later. It is time for you to pick it up. It is time for the fire to be reignited in your life and for you to run with what God said. Because it's bigger than you. And every day, every minute, we must be soberly aware of what the cost is. Whose life is at stake because you decided not to walk in vision? Whose city is at stake because you decided not to walk in vision? It's about something way bigger than us. It is about something that is divine. It is about being a part of God's limitless vision forward in our life. What will we do with the vision that God has given us?